hypersonic cruise missiles are possible only because, in the last decade, finally a new type of engine has become viable. We are talking about the scramjet engine, or in full, the supersonic combustion ramjet engine. I'm the Crow, welcome to Millennium 7 Star, the channel that helps you make sense of military history and military technology. Since the end of the Second World War, the aeronautic research focused on achieving higher and higher speed. Supersonic speed was actually achieved shortly after the war, and it was believed that the trend was going to continue and hypersonic speed was going to be achieved in few years. Unfortunately, this aspiration was trumped by a host of technical issues that have been finally resolved only in the last couple of decades. The scorching temperatures and the stability issues were problems, but nothing compared with the absence of an engine capable of operating reliably and consistently above Mach 5. Turbojets and turbofans, the most common type of aeronautic engines, are not very efficient beyond the transonic speed range, and the reason is quite intuitive. If the flow entering the compressor is transonic or supersonic, each compressor blade will start producing a maze of shocks and potentially flow separation and other issues. The shocks compromise the blade efficiency and waste the flow energy into heat. To avoid this, the air intakes would need to slow down the flow to a speed manageable for the compressor. This process is called recovering the pressure. But slowing down from hypersonic to subsonic would again waste an enormous amount of energy and increase the temperature at unmanageable levels. Beyond the speed of sound, the turbojet engine loses efficiency quite quickly and only the afterburner allows modern planes to reach speed between Mach 2 and Mach 3. Ramjets do better at high speed using a convergent intake to compress the air and recover the energy of the flow. They are also very attractive from the design and construction point of view because they are very simple, because they basically don't have any moving part. The problem is, the combustion of normal fuels need to happen at subsonic speed. If the speed in the combustion chamber increases too much, the flow may become faster than the speed at which the combustion propagates. So basically the flame is taken away, downstream, out of the combustion chamber. And to be honest, a slow and turbulent flow is exactly what you want because it mixes air and fuel much better the combustion efficiency is much better. So, if the flow needs to be subsonic in the combustion chamber, the problem of slowing down the flow too much is still there. So, between Mach 4 and Mach 5, the ramjet becomes basically inefficient. At the end of the day, the only hope of achieving sustained hypersonic speeds was to have an engine that didn't slow down the flow too much. To do so, the combustion must happen at supersonic speed. And believe me, you have to fix a lot of issues to do this. In its basic form, a scramjet has a converging air intake, a supersonic combustion chamber, and a divergent nozzle. The convergent intake compresses the air doing the so-called pressure recovery, which helps the engine efficiency. An important design consideration for the intake is managing the shocks, the primary or secondary, that form near the intake in a way that doesn't interfere with the rest of the structure because the heating that happens at the shock acts as a blowtorch on the metal structure. Often, along the intake, there are secondary shocks starting at the leading edge, bouncing off the walls, which are undesired because they dissipate energy and heat, uh, but in most cases they are unavoidable. Ahead of the combustion chamber is often found a section called the isolator. 
at low hypersonic speed, say Mach 5 to 8, the strong pressure gradient may cause flow detachment from the walls at the end of the intake and within the combustion chamber. This detached region becomes subsonic, so the disturbances generated in the combustion chamber then propagate upstream in the subsonic region and the overall effect is to create a train of shock waves that disrupt and reduce the efficiency of the converging intake. The isolator reduces this effect, avoiding the propagation towards the mouth of the intake. A particular strong combination of shocks in the intake might cause the flow in the combustion chamber to go subsonic, in a situation which is called choking. Given the energies in play, choking might severely damage the structure or even cause it to explode. Supersonic combustion in the combustion chamber poses a new series of problems. For example, the fuel injection mechanism must be such not to disrupt the flow too much because at supersonic speed any discontinuity may cause a shock wave and a loss of efficiency. The fuel is injected at a very high pressure by a raise of nozzles on the chamber walls, creating a mesh of subtle jets that blend in the flow. The combustion itself needs to be very quick because it must at least match the speed of the flow in the combustion chamber. Common aromatic fuels like the JP7 might burn fast enough for the lower range of the hypersonic speed but it is known that many different types of exotic hydrocarbons have been used to speed up the combustion. In some cases, even hydrogen has been tested as a possible fuel. Another technical solution to maintain a regular combustion in different conditions is to inject pyrophoric agents in the combustion chamber together with the fuel. An important design consideration is the fact that with the temperature increase in the combustion chamber, the Mach number decreases. This means that even if the flow inside the engine is still moving at a speed which would be supersonic outside, the conditions in the combustion chamber will be subsonic. This is a condition known as thermal choking and it is very dangerous because it might even cause the engine to explode. Scramjet technology is maturing just now, but it is not ready yet for the transport of humans or cargo, because the scramjet is in a delicate equilibrium that, once broken, can cause even destructive consequences. However, as a propulsion for an hypersonic cruise missile, it is brilliant. Since it is destroyed with the rest of the weapon, the reliability must be in the order of the minutes the relative simplicity of components make it probably cheaper than small turbojet used on cruise missiles. It can propel a beta metal with not much efficiency. I personally believe that we are just seeing the beginning of this technology. So if you like this video, you may also like the videos beside me. In the meanwhile, please subscribe, hit the bell and consider supporting the channel on Patreon. For the moment being, Thank you very much for watching and goodbye.